Sally, and I hope you're all enjoying your ice cream this week. Um, you're listening, um, you were listening to Ragtime music earlier. This piece was written by Scott Joplin. Um, the theme of the ice cream social is the 1915-1916 Bubble Park Exposition. So each table was uh, themed to a specific exhibit at the exposition. So that's what that is. Okay. another era, the Victorian period. Queen Victoria ascended the throne in June 1837 and reigned until her death in January 1901. Our fashion show is based on this 54-year period. We have some beautiful models who have chosen to create their gowns inspired by famous paintings, fashion plates, and photographs of the day. For example, the gown that I made, I fell in love with this fashion plate, all the pleating on it, so I had to do it. So, this is all hand pleated using a fork. Yeah, I wrapped each one around four times, and it was about 45 yards. is a trim of red piping to make it all pop. This is a day dress, and at more than 25 yards of fabric, it would have been something a woman of at least middle class might have worn. A wealthier woman might have used silk to make this dress. The top is called a bass due to the below the waist nature of it. It has a pleated peplum to add another layer to the look. Big brimmed bonnets were popular during the first half of the century and were perfect for day wear to keep the sun out of your eyes. This example is of straw and trimmed with matching fabric and flowers. In many cases, the more adornment, the better. What would you do with 194 hours? Well, three years ago, Jennifer spent that time bringing to life her dream fashion plate dress. From the Godey's Lady Book, July 1876, Jennifer started this project from the skin out and made the appropriate chemise, drawers, corset, and lobster tail bustle. On top of all that, she is wearing a, red, a renamed ruffled petticoat followed by a trained petticoat. The petticoat train 
is tied to the skirt chain to keep the layers together when walking or dancing. The skirt, which is the showcase piece of the dress, consists of the trained underskirt, which forms the base for the lower front apron and the pointed overskirt. The pink knife pleated ruffle was sewn first to the skirt hem. The lower apron was made separately and mounted to the underskirt and lays over the pleated ruffle. Jennifer and a fellow costuming friend put their brains together on how to accomplish the pointed overskirt. After studying the fashion plate for a while, they decided on using yarn and safety pins. By playing with the yarn lines tied to the safety pins at various points, they were able to duplicate the fashion plate points in both angle and placement. The main white fabric is cotton batiste imported from Switzerland. It was puffed up and mounted to stiff organdy and then outlined with pink bias strips made from the silk taffeta. Jennifer felt like she was making a wedding gown with all the white she was working with. That pink train and gym helped break it up a bit. The off-the-shoulder bodice is actually a polonaise, so, as was so popular during the mid-1870s. The front apron is cut in one piece with the bodice, so there's no way to see. It fastens in the back with lacing through hand-bound eyelets. The gown would not be complete without the addition of the beautiful roses. Jennifer made 44 roses from two different types of ribbons. The velvet leaves are actually millinery trim. She hand tacked every leaf so it would stay attached to the dress. If you'd like to reproduce this gown, here's a list of items needed. Seven yards of silk taffeta, in your choice of color. Eight yards of Swiss batiste. 15 yards of beautiful lace. 40 silk or ribbon roses. 224 velvet leaves, immense patience, and a willingness to dedicate yourself to a single project for three or more months. <laughs> 1870 marked a transition from the round hoop skirt into a straighter but still full front and flared at the back. <laughs> bell-shaped sleeve pleated at the elbow or added ruffles. Treasure is wearing a summer blue and white striped cotton polonaise decorated with white fringe. She has a triple ruffled skirt of two shades of blue which matches her, matches her sash and bows at the elbows of her bell sleeves. She carries her summer parasol and is wearing a hat with matching blue flowers. The Victorian polonaise was a revival style in the 18th century polonaise, also referred to as the milkmaid dress, and was a conscious imitation of rustic country women's habit of tucking their outer gowns up to keep them out of the muck. The 19th century revival style, sometimes described as Dolly Varden, had lost all connotations of this rustic origin. It was a middle class fad that only lasted a few years. Thank you, Trisha. Her inspiration piece is by the French painter Edouard Manet, titled A Bar at the Follies Bergère, painted in 1882. He presented this painting at the Paris Salon exhibition just one year before his death. The painting is the culmination of his interest in scenes of urban leisure and spectacle. The Folies Bergère was one of the most elaborate variety show venues in Paris, showcasing entertainment ranging from ballets to circus acts. Another attraction was the barmaids, who were as entertaining as the acts on stage. Joanne is wearing a beautiful jacket bodice in deep purple velvet that is cut away at the center below the waist. The neckline is framed in lace and the cuffs have matching lace attached. Her skirt is made from silver tied silk. 
in the natural form style popular from 1876 through 1882. Her jewelry consists of a bracelet on her wrist and a cluster of flowers on her body. Thank you, Joanne. Shelly is wearing a purple silk dinner dress in the deepest shade, suitable for a person just laying aside mourning. <laughs> it has two skirts, the lower quite plain, the upper one open on each side in the, of the front breadth and trimmed all around with a deep psyche fringe. The sleeves have one puff with a deep flounce. The corsage is round and trimmed by bars of fringe, forming a deep point further to the waist. Her hair is dressed plainly with a single rose. This is from the Godey's Ladies Book, January 1858. The widow Peters is a Civil War reenactor and owns her own business, the Kansas Mercantile where she creates historically correct merchandise and custom clothing, including corsets. She teaches workshops on period clothing construction and is a vendor here at Gaslight Gathering. Shelley was inspired to make this gown as her third morning dress and has made everything she is wearing. Shelley is also wearing an heirloom cameo brooch, which was her grandmother's. Thank you, Shelley is Aurora Bird Darlington from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yes, Bird's husband, John William Darlington, is an executive with the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, which opened its new office on 4th Street last year in March of 1872. Mrs. Darlington is wearing a blue silk walking dress with organzas with organza undersleeves fashioned from the November 1872 edition of the Doty's Lady Book. The jacket, skirt, and apron are trimmed in pleats, ruching, and braided, braided ribbon. Bert would like to thank the editor of Doty's Lady Book, Mrs. Sarah Josepha Hale, for her forward-thinking concepts in fashion and color. Bert created her dress on a Singer sewing machine purchased for her by Mr. Darlington directly from the new factory in Elizabethport, New Jersey. All of the pleating was done on a plater made by Centennial, which she has displayed in the back if anybody would like to look at it after. Rumor has it that Bert wore, that, that Bert last wore this dress earlier in the season at the March launching of the steamship Indiana. For those with a 21st century perception, the bustle, jacket, and skirt are based off of the truly Victorian pattern line. The Dale Wynn hat from Denise may be designed in Colorado. Thank you, Chris. Kate Clinton. Caitlin's gown is based on one of the dresses seen in the painting, A Ball on Shipboard by James Tussaud, painted around 1874. The dress is all done in white cotton. The underskirt is a plain white cotton boil, tightly pleated in the back to allow for the bustle. The skirt also has a small pocket on one side seam, which is perfect for holding a band. The overskirt is a draped apron front with half bustled back and a triple crossed pin tuck. The bodice has a short basque back, square neckline, and three quarter length sleeves done also in the same pin tuck as the overskirt. The bodice and the overskirt are edged with a Swiss two inch wide beading with scalloped edge laces, lace, which one and a half inch wide black satin ribbon has been woven through. The same black satin ribbon is wrapped under the sides of the overskirt between the apron and the bustle and down the seams in the underskirt. The dress is worn over the correct period undergarment, which in this era consists of a chemise, bloomers, corset, petticoats, and a cage bustle. All of which led to the dress 
lends to the dress the correct shape. The dress is worn with a straw boater hat, which has a black satin ribbon band with a bow at the back and a small fall of black chiffon from the bow. 